Hello everyone, welcome to episode 32 of the What The Hell Are We Doing podcast. Today we're having an amazing actor, Catherine Norland, from the Darman videos. She's a, a big motivational and an inspirational uh, content creator. She's a lot, uh, she's a, a lot of, um, how do you say this? Um, she's always active on Instagram, if you guys want to check her out, I'll put all her links in the description below. And um, yeah, um, uh, we'll be starting in very, very soon. Um, let's see. Hello, Catherine. How are you? Hi. Hi. Great. How are you? I'm pretty good. Tell us about yourself and uh, what you do. Well, my name's Catherine Norland, and I am an actress and a writer and a mom <laughs> <laughs> living in Los Angeles. I'm also a filmmaker and a writer and producer. Yep, yep, indeed. So, um, what books or plays have you um, written before? Well, um, I've written a couple of screenplays. I've written a few short films. I've written one feature-length film, but I never, I never made the movie yet. Uh, a lot of short films I have made. Uh, Right now, I'm currently working on a new book, but my previous books, <laughs> I have Poetic Prescriptions for Pesky Problems, Poetic Prescriptions for Plaguing Problems, and Poetic Prescriptions for Eternal Youth are my three books I have out right now. Oh, nice. And um, what's the inspiration behind your books? Uh, you know, I used to use writing as a form of therapy. Whenever I was going through really some tough trials in life and I just felt like I couldn't talk to anybody and no one understood me, I just would write out all my problems. And then one day I was praying and I felt like I felt like I was supposed to then write the solution to what the problems are. I wasn't just supposed to write about the problem because then, you know, like misery loves company, great, we can all say we all have problems. But then how do you come out of it? What's the solution to it? And that's where the Poetic Prescription series was born. I like to say I prescribe poetry instead of pills to cure your emotional and spiritual ills. So just really coming up with answers for the dilemmas that we face in life. Nice. So, um, what are some um, some uh, situations that you've overcome that you never thought you would actually overcome, or some more motivation to those who are dealing with something or are struggling with those uh, issues? Mm -hmm. Well, number one piece of advice is never ever make important life decisions when your emotions are all out of whack. When you've just gone through something horrible or tragic or horrific don't make big life decisions when you're going through that because your mind isn't in the right place um, I see that happening a lot when people people go through something bad and they're like I'm quitting I'm giving it up I'm stopping I'm not gonna do that anymore and that's not the time to make the, the decision so never allow your emotions to dictate what you do in life let your goals dictate what you do in life and you'll have better success if you do that. <laughs> yes. So um, how has acting been a different uh, sort of career path for you than your other, other life choices, like, such as you said, uh, writing or um, making plays? Mm -hmm. Well, I had a lot, of, a lot of different jobs I worked before I got into the entertainment field. Um, but it's different. It's different in so many ways. I mean, I think writing and acting in some ways have similar things with the you just the creativity and having to either develop a character or become a character that has some similarities but writing is really a solitary endeavor whereas acting you're with tons of people and you're feeding off each other and there's the energy and the vibes and the fun and the camaraderie and then you're at home alone, sitting on the computer by yourself, trying to be brilliant, is the lonely life of a writer. So I feel like I wish I had time to do more of it, but in other, in other ways, 
ways it's kind of like, oh, you're, you're just writing in a vacuum. You're really trying to come up with something out of nothing. Um, where acting is great because the writer already came up with the stuff and you just need to bring it to life. So they're different. Um, they're each rewarding in their own way. I think acting is more of a quick, a quick fix, a, a quick high, whereas writing is kind of slow and painful. It will take months, sometimes years, to write a book or a screenplay, and then some of it never sees the light of day. It never comes out, so it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. <laughs> so was acting your first job, or do you have any previous experience with different other type of jobs or career path? Oh my goodness, yeah, I worked, I mean, I did my first play in grade school, but it wasn't a profession at the time. Um, I did uh, like a play during like community theater, but no, my first job was babysitting, and then when I was 16, I got my first job at McDonald's, and I worked a lot of just random jobs. Some jobs I only lasted one day at, and I've had a couple jobs where I lasted three and a half years. Uh, two jobs I lasted a day at, the worst jobs I ever worked. One was being a sign spinner. Oh. People on the corner spinning the signs. I did that in the hot California heat. I lasted one day, never went back to that. And then I had another job, awful, awful, freezing cold, working in a freezer, refrigerator, like at a meat packing plant. It was awful, awful. <laughs> so those are the two jobs I only lasted one day at. And then the two jobs I lasted the longest at, one was the McDonald's job. I lasted three and a half years. And then parking cars for an all-female valet parking company. And it was called Valet Girls. So play on words, valet and valley girls. <laughs> And honestly, I think I'm about to hit the longest I've ever worked at a job is coming up is for Darman. I think that's about to be my longest job because I started October 2018. So it's, um, Four years? Yeah. So it's my fourth season, but my third year. So if I last a few months longer, then it'll be <laughs> the longest job I've ever had. <laughs> Nice. So I forgot to ask you before, but how was your vacation in Arizona? Oh, it was lovely. I don't know if you were keeping up on some of my stories on Instagram. <laughs> I have a few more to post. It was a lot of fun. I should probably put a video together or something. But uh, first vacation for Elijah. Elijah is our three-year-old, and he's never been on a vacation before. We had taken Timothy there to a different place in Arizona when he was six. Um, it's much different traveling with a six-year-old compared to a three-year-old. Three-year-olds do not do good on 10-hour car rides, so <laughs> it's a challenge, but we, we did good. Nice. Do you have any um, uh, ex oh, what's called, uh, memorable experiences you had throughout your trip? Uh, I really loved the night before we left. We went to this dinner theater called The Blazing M Ranch. Ooh. And pretty much everything else Rob picked, and this was something I picked. I'm like, I think I would like to do this. So we, we got there, and they had people, it was like a little old west town, and people were dressed in the old west costumes. And we, we took a little tractor ride around the ranch, and they told us all about the ranch, and you could get old time pictures taken and dress up if you wanted to. Uh, I did something I'd never done before. I rode a mechanical bull. <laughs> that was interesting. Much harder than it looks, let me tell you that. Uh, I did axe throwing for the first time. That is actually also much harder than it looks. <laughs> um, I shot an old time, um, I don't know how old the gun was, like a 45 Colt something. Uh, at, this, at the Target, that was fun. They had a little museum there. Then they fed us all a big dinner and we got to watch a, like a little singing show with some funny comedy sketches. And I think that was probably the highlight of my trip. But even just spending time with the kids uninterrupted without being on my computer, which is what I'm doing six days a week is. If I'm not shooting something, I'm at home on the computer all day. So it was like, seven days straight of uninterrupted family <laughs> time so that was definitely a change 
Yeah, that, that's that's amazing. Family time is always worth more than either a job or how much you get paid. It's always worth more. Yeah. So, Catherine, what are some <laughs> big accomplishments accomplishments you, you are proud of, either um, on the job or in life? Um, well, I'm still married to my high school sweetheart. <laughs> that's a big accomplishment. Yeah. Not a lot of people can say that. They... Uh, met someone in when they were a teenager and they're still together um, after more than two decades um, also I think my two kids are my greatest accomplishments I would say um, yeah I, I for me it's also the books that I've written because that's like pouring out my heart and soul and my thoughts and putting it into the world and putting my babies out in the world to be accepted or be rejected or you know I, I would say those those are big ones I've also got some things that I'm currently working on that I I'm very proud of that will be out soon oh nice so would you mind giving us a bit of a creative background over your books um the whole yeah. um, um it's not inspiration but like whole backstory behind your books and what they're about mm -hmm. so I with a punch for Jesus freaks spiritual snobs believers bustling to be better and hypocrites hankering to be holy it's for all those people that want to be better but know they're not and they're trying to work on it but they don't know how and they hit these situations and I've had people say to me uh, I love when people say you know I don't really I don't like poetry but I like your poetry or normally I don't understand poetry but yours I totally get you know when they leave me these comments it's like it's fun it's quirky but at the same time it like it hits it hits home and I've had people say wow you really you really share a lot of personal stuff you you, you don't hide you go there so I go I go into my faults and my problems and the issues that a lot of people would try to cover up and pretend like everything is okay and I rip it apart and I display it and talk about it so that other people who are going through stuff can feel like, wow, I'm not alone in this and they can, you know, help overcome their problems as well. Yes. So let's get back to the juicy questions. What's your favorite Darman video you've participated in? <laughs> But I would say if I could narrow it down to like three of them, <laughs> um, uh, I really love the one. <sighs> so okay, so and maybe I'll say it's the one about a teen who's about to jump off a bridge. Uh, I play a mother, and she's on the bridge holding up a sign that says "More hugs, less suicide." Oh, I've and I'm giving that. hugs to everybody. Have you seen that one? Yeah, I've seen that one. Yeah. I'm giving hugs to every stranger that walks by, and some man's like, "Uh huh, you're not gonna make a difference. Who really <laughs> cares? You know, whatever." And my, of course, my so you see backstory is, um, I had a son who killed himself, and so I'm out on that bridge every night where my son killed himself, giving hugs to strangers so they don't do the same thing. So that was. That's probably my favorite, and it's not even one I listed in my eight favorite <laughs> video I made. It's like my number, number, number one favorite, probably. It's meant the most to me, and I've had people who've seen that video actually inbox me and send me messages saying they were going to kill themselves, and they saw that video and decided not to. So I think, I think it's made a big impact on people. So... Um, you do mind telling us a bit more about you and Aiden Minka's uh, mom and son on stage? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we've been a dynamic duo for a long time, for a couple of years now. Um, he's probably played my son at, what, at least 15 times, probably. Um, I don't know, he was kind of shy and withdrawn when I first started working with him, kind of kept to himself. And now he's like blossomed. He's like this completely different kid, ball of energy, always smiling. Every time he turned.
to him, he's doing some kind of dance, doing some kind of cookie walk. He's just, I don't know, he's just fun. And seeing, you know, seeing what he's accomplished, I mean, he has, his, as a teenager, having his own merch line, and just, just ins he just, I think he just inspires a lot of people, and it's, Man, I wish I was like that when I was a teenager instead of sulking around depressed and hating myself. <laughs> <laughs> I would be so much further in life if I if I could have grasped that that um, it took me a while to get here. It took me a while to be happy. Um, but hey, I'm here now. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you could go back in time, what advice would you give yourself back then to motivate yourself and be be uh, more happier? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know what, who cares what other people think of you? They have their own insecurities. What they're saying to you, how they're judging you, is honestly just a reflection of how they feel about themselves. When someone picked on me or bullied me, instead of just feeling bad about myself, going and crying and thinking I'm the worst person in the world, I would, I would have... Instead of just believing every comment I was told, I would have done some soul searching and said, wait a minute, is this even true? Why, why when I was a teenager, when someone put me down or said bad things about me, why did I just believe it? And are they somebody that I should believe? You know, do they have an important place in my life? And I should have realized, you know, this, this was before there was like the term trolls or haters or... <laughs> You know, I didn't know that there was just people in life who would just be mean to be mean. And so I took everything they said and made it, made it like destroy my life. So the, my younger self, I would have said, first of all, don't take advice from someone you wouldn't trade places with. So if they're talking trash, talking hate about you, would you even want to have their life? Would you want to be miserable and mean and nasty and treat people? No. So you just can't take advice from someone like that. Awesome. Yeah, that, that's some good advice. So, um, I, I saw one of your videos, and I and I felt very uh, heart touched because uh, it, it like very really synced in with me. Uh, I think it was your high school video. I don't remember the title of it, but I remember commenting in it. Uh, would you mind giving us a bit more insight on that video and uh, what it meant um, to the people, to people who watched it? Can you give me more hints of what this video is about? Because I'm not sure <laughs> what video you're referring um, to. I'll, I'll look at it right now. Um, okay. I'm like trying to remember. Uh -oh. um. Was this on my own channel? Yes, it was. Um. Oh, it's uh, the user shortcut to success. Uh, productivity, Catherine Norlin video oh okay okay um, yes you know when when i make these inspirational videos for youtube it's what kind of like you asked me what would you tell your young self i i start to remember all the times in my life where i failed and i fell short and i didn't know what to do and i was down and depressed and i was stuck and i didn't know how to move and i had no motivation and I and I see where I am now and how I got over it. And whenever I whenever I come across people on the internet or they inbox me questions and I see what they're going through, I remember what it was like to be in that place. And so I just I give advice from the heart to let people know, hey, you're not alone. This is what I would do, you know, in that situation. This is how you need to overcome it. And I want to be, you know, that mentor, that that person that's saying you're not alone let me help pull you out of the pit so we can walk hand in hand together I want people to know they're not alone so whenever I come across a situation where I remember something in my past and how I got over it I want to bring that solution to people I want to help them and it's it's really born from what people ask me but it triggers oh I remember when I was in that place and then I I'm vulnerable and I and I share my trials and my failures and I I just I, I just think that's that's how you can 
really help other people find freedom. It's because it's so easy to be on the internet and acting like you have this awesome life, this perfect life, this movie star life, and you don't have any problems, and you only shoot yourself from the best angles when you have your hair and makeup done, and blah, blah, blah. And I, to me, that's, that's not even relatable to people. Yeah, you can, it might be aspirational for a hot second to, oh, I wish I had that money, I wish I had that body. But then when you realize it's not really a, attainable to most people, you start to instead make people feel bad about yourself. But when I started being vulnerable, when I started showing myself without makeup on, when I had did not have my hair comb, if I'm crying, whatever, people people go, wow, she's a real person. And, and I just think it's more relatable and people don't feel so alone when they see you're not this celebrity you're not just this person that has everything going right you're you're down in the mud you know with them and i i think that's important to show yeah um that's also very cool because like most actors or, or celebrities like you said are in very humble or down to earth and um don't want to be like related to every every everyone day-to-day -day life so that's yeah. that's very unique to have someone like yourself very humble and down to earth so another in, in other words one of your other videos is like you on the road giving quotes would you mind giving us a on the road quote <laughs> <laughs> oh that's what you meant by that um a lot of it just comes to me in the moment <laughs> um so like once I was like struggling with multitasking, like I had too much, too much stuff going on my plate and I started to get all like stressed out and crazy. And I remember coming up with one that said, tackle and tame one tiger at a time and don't get tangled in the tempting jungle of multitasking. So <laughs> it's kind of a poetic, a lot of uh, alliteration, but sometimes i just come up with stuff on the spot and i don't always remember it i have to go back and watch the videos um another one i came up with for a video was um whatever god gave you and however he made you no one can dissuade you if god wants to display you and i say that to people who maybe think they don't have everything going for them they maybe they're not the smartest they're not the cutest they're not the best they're not they don't come from a great background, but no matter what anybody says, however God made you, whatever you're working with, no one can stop you if God says it's your time to be out front. You know, you make a platform for yourself. God will make the way. He'll open up the doors to display you, to have the level of success that you need to have. But I do think, as you mentioned, I think humility is a big part of it because Prideful people fall, fall, they have a great fall. <laughs> and if you know what, if you're humble and you're not trying to climb on everybody to get to the top, to get, a to get ahead, um, you know, when you do stumble and fall, you don't have that far to fall from because you're already humble. I remember once, you know, sometimes people get discouraged. They're like, well, man, I should be further in life. I haven't done anything. I'm not, I haven't you know, accomplish any dreams and did it. I remember my pastor saying once, well, then you better get going because you can't hurt yourself falling from the bottom. And I remember that thinking that was so funny. Sometimes we think, well, I can't launch this company. I can't launch this channel, this podcast, this CD, whatever, because I'm nobody, nobody knows who I am. Well, guess what? That's the best time to launch it because if you fail, you don't have far to fall. <laughs> you know, if you're a big famous movie star celebrity and you launch something and it fails, that's a high place to fall from. <laughs> but guys, if you haven't done anything yet and you're scared to do something because you haven't done anything, it's like the opposite. If you if you're at the bottom, guess what? It's not very far to fall. <laughs> so go for it. Um, yes, yes. Um, there's th that's a big um, gap. So I, I definitely relate to that a lot because. Um, there was a lot of successes and um, mishaps throughout this ent entire podcast. Like we had many episodes planned um, before we did this one that never launched or never went published. Yeah, so yeah, that that's very relatable. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so 
if you can uh, collaborate with any artist, singer, um, content creator, who would it be and why? Hmm. Interesting. Ah. <laughs> well, um. You know, I really like an actor, David Morris. Oh. And I like his acting and I like his his values and how he his how he like puts his family first um who are some other ones i don't know many singers but i could probably tell an actor or two uh, i also really like i don't know why i'm blanking on his name right now um he's starting guardians of the galaxy oh the, um is It'd it the, really cool is it um star lord the, the actor the lead guy uh, he was the lead guy who was a kid, and I'm gonna remember his name right when we're done. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, he. I think he would be really cool to work with. Uh, we. I don't know. We have something in common. We both uh, had our children premature, so you know sometimes it's nice to work relate to people who've like been through some of the same stuff that you've been through. I think it would be really cool to work with Denzel Washington too. That would be on my dream list of actors to work with for sure. Did you mean Chris Pratt? Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> <pretty> <laughs> <laughs> you remember. <How> So we went over Aiden um, and his videos with you. Um, the, what, what's your favorite moment with Colin? Because I believe you guys both also did videos with like uh, lawyers and uh, wives and all of that. What's your favorite moment with Colin? Yeah, he's 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 actually played my husband in multiple episodes, um, and lately we're in a th three or four now coming up where he's the teacher and I'm the mom of the kids he's teaching, but. Um, Oh, we've done, we've probably done at least 10 or 15, at least 10 or 15 where he's played my husband. Um, I liked the one, um, Gold Digger sues her own husband oh. and it was in the courtroom and then he shows up as the surprise lawyer who I have this history with, who I, uh, was trying to be a gold digger to him too. Um, that was a really fun one to shoot. Uh, I enjoyed that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are your thoughts on the uh, the evolution of Darman videos from being a skit to being like almost a full movie video? Um, yeah, they have gotten four. Some of them are four or five times longer than when I started. When I started, they were five or six pages, and I just shot the one with the plus size ballerina and that I think that was like 24 pages so and and I think Dar recently wrote the one that was 30 pages so yeah it's been a huge the scripts have gotten longer the storytelling's gotten better it like he's leveling up he's leveling up in so many ways in the actors in the production value in the storytelling in the length of the scripts um, I just I'm honored to be a part of, to be a part of this, I don't even know what to call it, a journey. movement. <laughs> <laughs> journey, yeah, journey, what a movement, all of it, it's, it's really beautiful to see. I mean, I had a mom um, reach out to me just this week because her daughter met me on vacation. She, she ran into me and she recognized me and wanted a picture taken with me and, her mom was telling me that she had gone through some really tough trials and some abuse and she thinks that the Darman videos are what actually is the reason she's still here and still going and how it made such a big impact on her and and I know for every person who tells me that I'm sure there's hundreds if not thousands of others that feel the same way that they finally don't feel alone in the world. They finally go, wow, I'm not the only one getting bullied or, you know, I'm not the only one who's dealing with this. And it's a nice way to cope, to be able to get through what you're going through. Um, Catherine, do you as an actor feel a sense of um, comfort when you um, make someone's day better or influence them and, I don't know, protect them in a way throughout the Darman videos? 
uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? The, um, do you feel a sense of comfort um, when you influence others throughout their Dharma videos? Or oh, what, what do you feel when you uh, inspire or motivate someone throughout their Dharma videos? Hmm. You know, I don't always know that I'm doing it, but I, you know, I do get messages uh, on a daily basis where people are reaching out to me and um, I'm not sure if it's comfort. In, in some ways, I, I feel like I'm, I'm stepping into, it's like a continuation of my purpose. So I, I started, you know, writing my books back in 2008 and putting out these inspirational messages and I started putting out the videos where I'm giving advice to help people probably I don't know maybe nine months before nine or ten months before I even knew about Dar before his channel started so I felt like I wanted to get my advice videos my help my to help people I wanted to do it on a bigger scale but I didn't know how to do it and then when I got the opportunity to work in Dar and his platform blew up it made what I was already doing be able to expand on a bigger level because I always had these like wisdom nuggets and this yearning to want to help people and I've always been like this mother hen who's always wanting to make sure everybody's okay and I would spend long hours giving my friends advice over the phone and just making these videos and doing, you know, giving these advice to people. It's it's been able to expand because finding the fans who like my work on Dar Man, then they come find my channel and they're like, whoa, I never knew that you had your own stuff and you're making your own videos. It's been, it's been great because it's something I've always done or been doing or, you know, if you go all the way back, 15 years on Facebook, I'm putting out these inspirational quotes and messages. It's just that nobody knew about me. <laughs> so it's not like I'm new to the inspiration self-help game. It's just that um, being a part of DAR has is, is expanded my platform in a beautiful way. And what I love about it is that really aligns with where I was already headed. And now it's just expanded to a bigger level. So I, I think it goes hand in hand together. So, as you know, you're an actor. Um, what other um, A-list actors have you met? Um, maybe in um, other productions like a movie or a TV show? Because you, you, before Dharma, mm -hmm. you, you were in other uh, productions such as a TV show. Um, mm -hmm. um, have you met anyone else? Any actors? I mean, I, I, I haven't kept a list, so I probably don't remember everyone. But um, I met and uh, David Hasselhoff. Uh, I saw him sing in person and met him at a film festival, and I was an extra in a movie he did. Um, I met Charlize Theron once, and I didn't work with her yet, but she was um, speaking at an event, and I had a chance to meet her. Um, I met the, I'm blanking on his name, but I met once the, uh, Gary Coleman, who was the star of A Different Strokes, which is a TV show in the 80s. Um, I also worked with Martin Cove uh, in the film Reality Terror Night, and he um, was famous for being in um, Rambo and The Karate Kid, and now in that spinoff on YouTube, Cobra Kai. Um, and I don't know if I... That's, that's the ones I remember right now. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever been to the Oscars or been nominated for an Oscar? No, I haven't done any Oscar level films. I've mostly done just little independent films. So I have not had the opportunity to do that, but I have been nominated Best Actress at a couple of different film festivals. And I recently won an award um, just like three months ago in Las Vegas for outstanding performance as an actor at the Las Vegas Black Film Festival. Nice. So, um, I believe we met through uh, the Hot Topic Celebs uh, interview with you on the podcast. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, tell us okay, about your experience on that. <laughs> that that was um that was an interesting podcast. I've never done one that was that long, that length. I was like, ooh, halfway through, I was like, I think I need to go to the bathroom. But 
I'm just gonna hold it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long interview, but it was fun. And he, you know, he asked me questions that I, like, I was blindsided. I was like, oh, I wish we would have had time to think about this one. Um, it was, it was interesting because he did, he did ask um, questions outside of the norm, which I had never gotten asked before. So. That's always delightful. I just wish I was uh, quicker on my feet to <laughs> have answers for them. <laughs> but other than that, it was good. He was he was really thorough and in depth, and um, yeah, I could tell he had a good background. And yeah, he 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 was a fan of the Darman stuff, and um, it was it was uh, it was delightful. Nice. So let's just say in the near future, if you could write any book or script or even a play, what kind of play would it be or what kind of books do you um, want to write about? Oh, my goodness. So I'm currently working on a, the, a fourth book in the Poetic Prescription series based on what people have been asking me for. And it's called Poetic Prescriptions for Demolishing Depression and Heading Towards Happiness. And it's, I'm talking about my journey of how I got out of depression and um, was able to actually finally be happy. Um, I also want to put out a book maybe next year. It's a couple books. <laughs> it's a couple books I want to put out next year. One is going to be based on my course, You Are Worthy. So I have an online course that I have been working on for three years since I started writing it, a year since I started filming it. I, I hope to release it in September. Um, but it's, it's, it's really my journey on how I overcame self-hate and found self-love by finding out what God had to say about me and how that proves I'm worthy no matter what I've done in life, what I haven't done, what I have or haven't accomplished, what I look like, you know, what my bank status is all of that um so for those who maybe uh wouldn't be able to afford the full like 10 hour long course um i want to put out like a book that's going to be like a truncated version that's more affordable but the i am also hoping next october to put out a book i've been writing about hollywood and some of the different people i've met in hollywood along the way um some things some troubles I've run into as an actress here um, it's it's gonna be different than anything I've ever written because all, all the other books so far are faith-based but this is gonna be kind of a nitty-gritty seedy book about like the underbelly of some of the <laughs> creepiest worst people I've met in Hollywood <laughs> sounds fun and, but it's, real life <laughs> it's real life experiences but if I'm gonna be true to like the one ultimate book I would want to write, there's one I've been trying to write for 13 years, and that is the memoir of the 118 days I spent in the neonatal intensive care unit fighting for my son's life. He was born four months early. He was this tiny little thing that was a pound and a half. The doctor said he had a 90% chance of dying. He had a hole in his heart. He didn't even have lungs. Like He didn't even have the branches in his lungs or the buds. It was so touch and go. It was a huge walk of faith. It was every day I would show up at the hospital and I didn't know if he was gonna be alive that day. I didn't know if he was gonna make it to the day. And I've, I've had some rough drafts, but every time I try to write it, I just find myself spiraling down and bawling and I can't <laughs> but I know it's gonna be it make a big difference and a big impact because I found out nowadays 10% of babies are being born premature I think that has to do with our stress these days our fast-paced busy life but it's that would be the ultimate book I would want to write um, if I could get myself to sit down and face my emotions and go back to that time because sometimes I get triggered and I have this PTSD of that stressful time and I I just freeze up or I, I'll just, I'll be driving and I'll think, oh, I should put this in the book and then I'll start remembering and then I've got tears streaming down my face. And um, it's something that, it's, it's hard to explain and, I, I feel like weird even using the term PTSD because you think of that as someone who's been through 
war or somebody gone through some violent crime, but really, I, and I, I noticed I had it when I couldn't even talk about the situation. I remember the first time after uh, maybe two or three years later when I tried to read one of the poems from the book out in public, I probably didn't even get three lines into the poem and I'm just bawling my eyes out and everybody in the audience is looking at me like, oh no, and people are coming up to me afterwards like, did your son die? Did you? I'm like, no, he's fine, he's alive. And they're looking at me like, well then why are you crying that he's alive and he's fine? <laughs> It's just, I don't know, something about that. So and I've talked to other people who've been through really scary situations in the intensive care unit with their children. And I don't know why I, I'm not just like totally fine with it, but for some reason it's still like a trigger. And then when I had my second son, 10 and a half years later, again, he was born premature. And it was like flashback and I remember one time I, I came that we have specific times. You can only see your child in this specific window of time. And if they, if they, if you don't come on time, you don't get to see your child. You don't, you, you're not allowed to hold them. And it's like, it's just like separation anxiety because you can't even touch your child. And it's supposed to be this time of bonding and nurturing. And I remember one time they, I was on time, but they decided to feed him early. So they wouldn't let me hold him. And I just remember this like flashback and I started just sobbing uncontrollably. And she's like, the nurse was like tripping out, like, like what is your problem? <laughs> but she didn't know about the 118 days I had spent previously in the neonatal intensive care unit. Like, can I see him? Can I not see him? Can I touch him? Can I hold him? Can I? And so it was like all these memories came flooding back. And so, yeah, that's why I haven't been able to write it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and does your son experience, uh, the, the, your, the experiences with your son, does that influence Catherine Norton, the actor that we now know? Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. I'm such a better actor now that I have, now that I have my sons. Mm -hmm. Really, it really took timothy being born for me to break down my wall to break down you know i think I, I think i had a part of me that was so guarded before i had timothy i was so guarded and coming from a background of having depression and low self-esteem i think i had this thing where i really really tried hard to present myself in the best way as if everything was going good and I didn't have any problems and da 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 and tried to so I think that was kind of a shell that didn't let me get down deep into who to be able to access my emotions but once I had Timothy it was like the floodgates broke open I couldn't help it I would be falling dripping snot out of my nose I, we would have these situations like in the hospital and he just, I mean, I, I was so frazzled. He was, I had to give him medicine like 20 times a day and he was on oxygen. And I didn't know what I was doing. I felt like I had to become a nurse. I was freaked out because different doctors would give him different medicines. And then I didn't know how are they going to interact with each other. They're not talking to each other. Am I going to overdose him? Am I going to kill him? <sighs> I remember calling the hospital in a panic because I thought I gave him too much and if I, he's on oxygen and I'm like not sleeping because I think he's gonna twist around in the crib and get the oxygen cord wrapped around his neck and strangle himself. <laughs> so I was like this hot mess and I got to the point where I did not care what I looked like. I would be out in public and he would be fighting me I'm trying to change his diaper and I'd be out and I had like poop stains on my sleeve and I was like I'm done caring what people think about me <laughs> and I think getting to that point where you're done caring it it just it frees you in your acting as well because you're no longer trying to look good or put on pretenses and like sometimes I see these actresses and they are so concerned about looking good that they're wearing fake eyelashes even when they're playing a homeless person <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I just, I just had to let it all go, and I think that's helped 
my range as an actress too to be able to play different from homeless to rich and everything in between so speaking of family and acting both the same um how do you balance or have uh, time management for both your family and your acting career mm -hmm. well i don't think there is like a true balance as they say because the the acting industry it's it's kind of sometimes it's all or nothing or feast or famine i might be working three days in a row 16 hour days but then you don't work for a week and a half or two weeks so it's not like you can do you know six hours family time six hours work you know six hours this and six hours sleep it's it's not like that so i think uh to quote an old song from was it the 70s or 80s love the one you're with uh, that's a refrain of a song love the one you're with so if you're acting love it be all in it don't be going gosh i wish i was at home with my kids i haven't seen my kids in three days someone else is putting cereal in their bowl and changing their <laughs> diaper whatever um and then when you're at home don't be when you when you have that dedicated family time don't be going oh i gotta get my next job when are they gonna book me again how can i because you don't want to have split focus so love the one you're with whatever comes your way be focused on that if it's family day like sundays i don't work people try to get me to work they try to get me to do interviews things like that i don't work on sundays because that's my dedicated family day so um you just have to set boundaries and have barriers otherwise for someone like me who is easily a workaholic i before i had kids i would work from 6 a.m till 11 or 12 at night and now i have to shut it off at 8 p.m and sometimes even that's too long there they'll be they'll be in my they'll be in here pulling at me mommy mommy so sometimes they get me to stop working because i just would just keep going 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 <laughs> <laughs> so um we, pre we previously interviewed an actor by the name of parker james fulmore and he's uh, one of the uh, billy eilid actors on um, um new york times square but i i don't know but like what would you say to young actors and what do you think of young motivational influencer actors who are like maybe taking over the industry and versus uh, older more professional actors i mean i think there's a place for everyone i think you're never too old and you're never too young i think if if you have this dream in your heart at a young age that's great go for it be careful let your parents in on everything um because sometimes I've, I, you know, I've seen in Hollywood some shady producers and directors that will prey on young people, um, take advantage of them, you know. So I would say, always have a buddy with you, always have your parent, always, you know, be careful. And then old actors, don't get discouraged. Yeah, there may be fewer parts for you, but also your competition probably has left the business. They, they got tired of, you know, uh, not getting parts you know it, I, there's there's room for everyone and I think I also think you can be inspirational at any age um, I've seen five-year-old preachers that I'm like what how do they know so much how do they they couldn't have read the whole Bible when they're five years old so I think any age you can be an inspiration and I think at any age you can go for your dreams I don't think there's limitations on age on race on size <laughs> so let's talk about COVID for just a little bit. Um, how did COVID affect your personal life or uh, people around you? Oh, that's wow. It had pluses and it definitely had minuses. I think a lot of people can attest to pluses and minuses. It 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 helped me I'll talk about how it helped me first it helped me get out of my like go 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 mentality uh, I'm one night I'm at Bible study the next night I'm in an acting class the next night I'm at voiceover class the next night I'm at wrestling practice the next night I'm at a networking mixer the next night I'm filming I'm gone I'm gone I'm always gone and everything shut down and I'm home and I'm home and I'm home <laughs> and every night I'm home and I had a lot 
lot of time to think and I had a lot of time to journal and I had a lot of time to see that I didn't have a lot of time that life is passing by quicker than I had anticipated and I haven't accomplished all the things I wanted to accomplish because I was always on the go somebody wanted me to go here somebody wanted me to do this somebody wanted me and I was always going and doing what other people wanted me to do and now I didn't have to go and do anything so I got to evaluate what was important to me and when when LA opened back up which it hasn't totally fully I, I, I got to be clear on okay even if this show starts back up again or this project starts back up or these things am I going to still want to do that and the answer to a lot of it was no I got clear on what what brought me joy and what made me happy and what is going to be part of my legacy and during that time I told you about the first book I wrote poetic prescriptions for pesky problems well during COVID I rewrote this entire book so that's why it's a second edition here now so I used my time wisely I rewrote all 77 poems in this book and 14 new ones and that's something I had always wanted to do but never had time because I was always gone um, and and I was able even though all the auditions shut down you know sometimes I would be going to six auditions a week there was no more auditions all of Hollywood shut down but I was blessed that because of I think Darman's contribution to helping people's you know helping their what do I want to say their mental state he was able to get um, I don't know what it's called but an essential workers permit so even though we were shut down for two or three months he got an essential workers permit so we could keep putting these we could keep filming and we could keep putting these positive messages out there and I remember carrying that paper in my bag so if I would be out on the streets if if a police person would stop me and say where are you going are you essential worker I could pull that paper out of my bag and say believe it or not as an actor I am an essential worker because people more than ever need content that's going to inspire them to keep going so those are the two Po the two or three positive things is I was home I had time to evaluate what I was doing I got to rewrite my book I got to keep working and I got clear on what I wanted to do in the future and what I was going to say no to um, the detriments yeah I think there was you know financial detriments but at the same time um, my husband did not lose his job and he's a been able to work from home this whole time so it's been it's been a blessing you know he doesn't have to drive an hour to work each way and back that's two hours of commuting which he hated which he doesn't have to do anymore um, but on a sad very sad note um, I lost my acting coach to COVID we had a lot of projects we were working on together a lot of stuff we were gonna do he was my my mentor and big influence in my life um, and and the reason I was, I was able to do a lot of things and accomplish a lot of things and he was extraordinary he was like the third best Shakespeare teacher in the world and he helped me a lot um, with rewriting some of my poetry and, and making it better um, and I lost my co-star from Darman Carl Carl Judy Carl. was lost to COVID yeah, do you remember him from a lot of episodes? Yeah, I remember him. I remember, yeah, um, was... I remember him coming up on the on a news article on, on Google uh, when he uh, passed away in, from Darman. Yeah. Yeah, and and um, a film I was in, which is a film I was in, which got just got distribution on Amazon Prime last year, called Magic Hour. Um, I lost my co-star to COVID as well, just a couple months ago. So. You know, three people, you know, friends and people in the industry taken out due to this. And, you know, I, I'm saddened over not only the deaths, but even the deaths of people's dreams. There's a lot of home, small businesses that got shut down because of this. A lot of people's livelihood just taken away. Um, 
so it's 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 sad and and I and and sometimes we just sit here and we feel helpless and we don't know what to do. Um, so yeah, that's that's um, what I would say about that. That actually leads us to our next question. Um, what are your thoughts on mm-hmm. many of the of the business show the show business and many other essential jobs and how COVID affected them? So that was our part yeah, two. Yeah, but I. Th- well, big time, big time, Hollywood was shut down. The movie theaters were shut down. I recently tried to go to the movie theater I used to go to almost every week, and they are no longer in business. So they, you know, a lot of movie theaters, the bigger chains were able to bounce back, but the smaller ones were not able to. Um, I think big budget Hollywood studio movies are moving forward. But the little guys, the little independent films like me that want to make a film for 200000 or 300000 which is not a lot of money. Um, now there's all these, um, to keep people safe on set, there's all this protocol you have to follow to have the, the COVID tests on set and the, the workers and making sure everything's sanitized. It's adding sometimes 10, 20, 30% of your budget. So now all these small little independent filmmakers who want to make their passion projects aren't going to be able to because they can't afford the cost of the COVID compliance stuff. So it's, you know, it, 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 I think it's affecting everyone. So Catherine, we're at our final five questions for your um, ending speech. <laughs> um, so let's talk a bit more about Hollywood, like you said. Um, um, you're going to write a book about Hollywood. Um, tell us a bit more about it. Uh, what, what are some experiences you've, you've faced in the Hollywood industry? So many. So many. Enough to fill up a book. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, there's ageism, there's sexism, there's... Uh, casting couch situations, Me Too movement, there's... I just, it's its too much to talk about for a PG audience, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, there's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of rejection. There's a lot of sometimes seeing someone get the part you didn't get because they would do something that you wouldn't do if you catch my drift. Oh, so just like the so, Starman video that where um, the... Uh, the um assist- yeah with the assistant step with the producer yeah 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 that stuff really happens and you know the whole weinstein thing there there i've been in some situations where yeah they shall remain nameless <laughs> so i'm happy that none of that stuff ever none of that stuff ever happens in a darman set and there's not even there's not if you've noticed there's not even kissing in Darman videos even with married couples so so I'll tell you one instance sometimes Hollywood directors and producers will cast you in a role where you're playing their love interest and then they'll want to rehearse the scene with you in other words they want to make out with you and and you're as a young actress you know I was in my 20s and I'm like you know, you, you have this fear and you're scared and you don't really know, like, is this normal? Is this, you know, and they, they make you seem like, they make it seem like everything. Of course, this is what you were rehearsing. We're rehearsing the scene. And and they they just, it just, I can't, I can't see, I can't even put words to it right now because <laughs> it brings me back to those times where, yeah. No, no worries, yeah, no let's worries. Not <laughs> let's not go there. <laughs> So, what do you think of the of the like women empowered movement, where um, women have a voice in the acting industry, whereas uh, um, certain people don't want that? I I'm for that, uh, of yeah. course. But like, what are your thoughts on that? You know, it's it, it's interesting. You said that. I just saw you know Ricky Yvette Westmoreland. Yeah. The Darman. I know. Ricky. Okay. It was interesting. Just I just remembered it when you mentioned. It. She posted a quote the other day. I don't remember it exactly, but it said something like, people will say you have an attitude, 
if you set boundaries. And it's like, sometimes in Hollywood and, and other places, men are allowed to say no and have boundaries and be firm that they're not going to do something. But suddenly when a woman says, no, I'm not going to do that, they're like, oh, she has an attitude, or she this, or she that. And just because you have boundaries, but if you don't have them, you get taken advantage of, you get stepped on, you get, you know, everyone knows there's less pay for females. I don't know if the statistics is still 73 cents on the dollar for the same job, but you'll see a man and a woman co-star in the same movie, and the male actor get 10 million, and the female actor get 5 million, you know, or whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, there, there, there is that. So, there, there, there hasn't come that equality yet. And not only is there not the equality in pay, if you've noticed, a female actor's career seems to be so much shorter than a male actor's career. I mean, they've made they've made many jokes about it that that women in Hollywood don't work after age forty unless they're Meryl Streep. Like, <laughs> she's the only actress that <laughs> made it beyond that. But th there is some validity to that, and that's that is one of the topics I talk about in my upcoming Hollywood book. So, <laughs> yeah. And uh, when is your <laughs> Hollywood book going to be released? I'm hoping, hoping to release it um, October of 2022. It's um, my birthday month, and um, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I like to I like to try to release a book on my birthday each year, <laughs> when possible. But um, we'll see if it happens this year. I've been so focused on getting my online course out that I'm not sure if it'll happen, but I'm going to do my best. <laughs> so what are some funny moments or crazy uh, things that happened to you on set while filming a, a Darman video? Um, you know, I don't think there's necessarily been anything like super, super, super funny. But everyone on the cast and crew is so personable and so fun that sometimes it'll just be silly little things and we will just be laughing hysterically. It could be a prop in the middle of the scene, the prop breaks in half and <laughs> falls apart or, you know, someone falling or blah, 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 doing, they're messing up their lines and they're going blah, 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 or just a lot of that's being caught now that we have a behind the scenes channel. They're putting the bloopers at the end. But, I mean, I can't really think of anything that's, like, so memorable. But just being around an atmosphere where people aren't angry. As I've worked on a lot of movie sets in Hollywood where the, the crew is angry, the director's angry, the producer's yelling, and everyone's, like, just in a bad mood. And you don't get that on the Darman set, so it's, it's, a, it's a nice change. <laughs> so what's one thing you wish you knew before you started acting or that, that you now know now? Um, I wish I would have known um, that sometimes you don't get the role and it has nothing to do with your talent. There were so many times where I would go to audition after audition after audition after audition. I wouldn't get the role. I'm like, what is wrong with me? I'm terrible. I'm no good. Uh, you know? And you don't know, you didn't get the role because um, they already cast three white people with blonde hair. They needed so they needed a different ethnicity, or or they already they, you you don't get the role because you remind the director of his ex girlfriend and he doesn't want that reminder on set every day, or you didn't get the role because you're too short, you're because your male co-star is shorter than you so they had to hire a shorter actress so he would look tall uh, there's so many reasons you don't get the role and it has nothing to do with your talent i wish i would have known that early on and i want new actors to know that so they don't quit prematurely you know i, I would say most of the time you're not getting a part has nothing to do with your talent because especially if you get a call back callback is when you get a second audition they want to see you again so they might see they might get 2,000 submissions for a role then they might get they might narrow it down to wanting to see a hundred of you in person they'll do and then then they narrow it down to 20 of you they want to see again if you get a callback that means any 20 of you are capable to do this role so any of you could do it. getting the callback like you've won even if they don't book you for the role 
So the other 19, there's all these factors like, well, how is she gonna look next to him? Or does she look too similar to this other actress? Or, you know, the height thing, the so many different things that are totally out of your control. Uh, oh, she's got two different colored eyes. Well, yeah, whatever. <laughs> out of your control. Nothing to do with your talent. So you just have to just let it roll off. Don't let it mean that you're terrible. Don't let it mean that you're not good. And if you, you know, if you have an agent, you can ask for feedback. Sometimes they can call the casting director and say, hey, did you? You know, especially if it's a callback, maybe not for a first audition. You know, what was it that about about my client that you didn't like? Oh, they'll say, oh no, Catherine was great. It's just that, um, you know, we already purchased the the, the 18th century costumes, and she's a she's got a little 10 extra pounds on her, and she won't fit in the costume. But her acting was great. You know, some of these productions they can't afford to get a costume in your size. I I have missed out on parts because I'm not stick thin. So these are things you just have to let roll off your back and not cry about it. You are the size you are. Be happy about yourself. If you don't like your size, lose the stinking 10 pounds so you'll fit the costume. If not, don't cry about it. Move on because there's another role where you'll fit in the costume. <laughs> <laughs> so what movies or TV shows have you been on or plan to be on? Um, well, I've been on Malcolm in the Middle. I've been on a TV show called Snapped, which is actually a true life reenactment show. Um, all these real life people, women, who have one day snapped and killed someone. So uh, that's a popular episode that's run for several seasons. I was also on two episodes of Beauty and the Baller. That was on a BET channel. Um, yeah, it was one of the BET channel spinoffs. Um, there's some stuff coming up, but I don't usually talk about stuff coming up that's out of my control because so many times I get booked in a movie, I get booked on some show or something, then it doesn't happen, they pull the plug, they rewrite the script, and the character's not in it anymore. It's like, if I could tell you how many things I've been cast in that have never happened, <laughs> or shows I've been cast in and shot and they never finished it or put it out, it's like, I have like 60 credits 68 credits on IMDb, I think, for acting, but honestly, I've been in over 150 projects, so you just never know. It's I I've, I've certainly have more experience than what it looks like online. <laughs> <laughs> so our final question for your um, um, ending speech. Uh, what is it like to be an actor or slash cast member of Darman or um, an actor in general? Well, those are two very different things. Being a cast member for Darman is completely different than being an actor in general. One is a delight. One is trudging uphill in the mud, barefoot, with no umbrella, while it's raining, and you're starving, and you don't know if you'll ever eat. That's, that's the being an actor in general. <laughs> <laughs> being an actor in Darman means you're going to eat, you're going to get fed, there'll, they'll probably give you an umbrella if it's raining. <laughs> you have people that will be walking up the mountain with you so you're not alone. <laughs> completely different experiences. I had 18 years as a, a regular actor and now three years as a Darman actor. And I, I have to say, uh, I much prefer the Darman experience. But don't get me wrong, not all my career before that was awful. I had some beautiful moments, great moments, fun times, great characters I played. But it's it's it is a, it is an uphill battle to remain an actor. The cost of it, you're paying for classes, you're paying for voice coaches, you're paying for wardrobe, you're paying to look nice, you're paying for trainers, you're going to auditions, you're spending the gas, spending the time, buying the headshots. You're, put, you're, you're paying for casting service, you're putting all this into it, and then maybe once every three months, you'll book a job that pays you $150. <laughs> it ends up, yeah, after you've spent thousands to get that one little job with one line, and so it's, it's not for the faint of heart. You have to really want it, because not everybody is gonna become an overnight success. So if you're only in it for the fame, for the court fortune, for wanting to be on the red carpets, and wanting to be discovered, I hate to tell 
you, but only 3% of actors make a living at it. So there's a 97% of us that are doing it because we love it, because it's our passion, because we can't imagine doing anything else. And yeah, we have to have a day job because we have to fund our passion. <laughs> nice. Uh, thank you for joining the What the Hell Are We Doing podcast, Catherine. It's uh, now time for the ending speech. What's the ending speech? Uh, <laughs> it's uh, where you influence the viewers or from what we talked about or motivate them um, yeah, from what we talked about. <laughs> so is it like a recap? Yeah. Or is it like, uh, okay, based on what we've talked about. Oh, and yeah, I do want to say before we do this epic ending speech that I'm not prepared for, that I'm going to wing. I want to let you know my film Cannibal Corpse Killers got distribution recently and I starred in this movie, have multiple fight scenes, awesome zombies. It's now available on Google Play, Tubi, iTunes, Redbox, Amazon Prime, Xbox, PlayStation, YouTube, Fandango Now, and lots of streaming services. So if you <laughs> want to see me playing a badass, am I allowed to say that word? Yeah. <laughs> that you do not see on the Darman series, go check out Cannibal Corpse Killers. Okay, end speech off the top of my head. If you have a dream in your heart, you have to go for it. Come hell, come high water, come obstacles that stand in your way. You can't let what anybody thinks of you stop you. You can't let others' perceptions stop you. If you have this dream burning in your heart, you cannot let other people take their words, which become a fire extinguisher and put out the fire you got to keep that passion burning you got to keep the kindling going you will regret it if you stop you can stop if you don't love it anymore you can stop if it doesn't become your passion anymore you can stop once you start to hate it but if you love it if you dream about it if you think about it if you go to the movies and you're like man this is I, I, I just want to do this one day don't stop because someone says you're too fat. Don't stop because someone says you're too short. Don't stop because someone says you're too dark. Don't stop because someone says you have a big nose. Don't stop because someone says you need plastic surgery. Don't stop because if you don't quit, you win. And you will, you will never get ahead in anything in life if you let other people's comments put you down. So you need to get on your earphones and, and just put on your favorite music and block out all the negativity from other people because there's going to be naysayers everywhere you go there's going to be loads of people who tell you you cannot win you're not going to do it it's not going to work they're going to quote you the statistics that only three percent of actors make a living even if it's true you can't let it discourage you so even if they present you with facts if it's a dream burning in your heart you can't even let the facts stop you your passion has to burn brighter and burn hotter than any of these other people's experiences because what they're speaking to you is their fear. They maybe care for you. They maybe don't want to see you get hurt, but someone trying to put out your fire is not helping you. Someone trying to dull you down so you don't get hurt is not helping you. Sometimes we need to face a little rejection to get stronger. Sometimes we need to meet challenges. We don't become strong with our muscles unless we meet some resistance. So if someone is paving the way, trying to make everything work out for you, you're gonna be weak. You're not gonna be strong. You're not gonna be able to stand to the storms in life if you've never faced resistance. So when you come across a challenge and you come across resistance, let it make you stronger. Let it build your muscles emotionally, mentally, spiritually, so that you're ready for the next storm and you can stand five seconds longer than you did in the last storm. And the next storm you can stand 10 seconds longer. And it doesn't matter if you fall down, it doesn't matter how many times you fall down, it matters how many times you get up. <laughs> that was amazing, that was amazing. Um, I forgot to ask one last question, my producers might hate me for this, but could you give us a so you see? <laughs> um, I believe I asked, it, I asked this to you on the um, um, Hot Topic Celebs as well. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. <laughs> so, you see. <laughs> so, you see. So, you see.
Um, thank you, thank you. Um, Catherine, um, thank you for being on the yeah. podcast. Um, could you give us your URL for your YouTube channel where people can find you, what you do, and your Instagram? Yes, please. Please come find me on YouTube. It's youtube.com forward slash user forward slash Catherine Norland. Or you could just type Catherine Norland into the search bar. I put out four videos a week. Um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are special, uh, our advice videos. They're my advice. And then Thursdays I put out an inspirational short. Fridays I put out a special video, which is usually a podcast, an interview, some acting stuff, a project I've acted in or directed or a poetry video, something that's more special. And every Sunday morning on YouTube, I go live at 8 a.m. to answer your questions. So my Instagram handle is Catherine Norland, and my Facebook handle is Cat Norland, K-A-T. Thank you. Thank you for being here, and um, have a good day, and I'll see you later. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Nerdy Albert. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.